Hey again, everybody. This is Chris with Overclockers Club. I have something really cool from TerraMaster. So a while back, I reviewed this one. Of course, the box is the same. But this is the F2-210. Where is it? F2-210. Somewhere on there. Yeah, F2-210. And this is a dual bay data storage unit or a NAS network attached storage. Great little uh, device. However, we've got one that's a couple notches above that. This is the F2-422. And the F2, the two part means it's just a dual bay. So if this was an F4, it would have four bays. If it was an F5, it would have five and uh, so forth. Now the other, the 422, I'm not sure exactly what that means. But when we get this thing out of the box, Here is the unit. Now it looks a lot like the F2-210, same physical presence, probably uses the same case. But there are a lot of differences in terms of the capabilities. So let me look at the goodie box here first. So there's the nice ethernet cable, power brick, comes with its own screwdriver and some screws for uh, attaching the hard drives to the little hard drive cages there. Some stickers to label your drives. This is probably out uh, warranty information. And then this is your, or should be, your quick start guide. Maybe, maybe not. Okay, so yeah, what this is, this is basically telling you yeah, this is your quick start guide, but your quick start guide is really online. So what you do is go to your uh, link here and your information will be online. So that's what that is. So looking at the actual unit, what is really, really nice about this, what I really like, is that it has several Ethernet ports back here. And that sort of tells the whole story because what we've got back here are a 10 gigabit link right here. And then there are two uh, one gigabit links and these can be hooked up uh, in link aggregation mode. So you basically are uh, using uh, the bandwidth of two gigabit single cables together. And then we've got two USB three uh, ports up here. And then this is where you plug in your power brick and it has a nice little cooling fan on the back. Looks like other models that use this case might come with uh, an HDMI port there, but this one does not. And again, this is the F2-422. So on the bottom, you can see it's vented to allow air in, which is pretty important. And then across the front here, we've got two little indicators for hard drive activity. So hard drive one, hard drive two, LAN activity, and a power LED. And then right there's the power button. The case on this uh, appears to be, this is, appears to be metal. Sometimes plastic can uh, feel that way too, but uh, this is pretty heavy. The front face is plastic and the back end cap is plastic. And these are the hard drive trays. So you can see it's got the mounting holes there so you can attach your hard drive to the trays. Look in the back, you can see the circuit board, little sockets where your hard drives plug in. And that's really it as far as the, the physical unit. And it's nice to know the dimensions because sometimes you want to tuck this uh, on a shelf in a bookcase or uh, in your desk. And it's nice to know the dimensions. So overall, front to back there, it's about nine inches. Of course, you want to leave some clearance behind the fan there so you've got some airflow so you don't want to block that off so you don't want to push this right up against something but again we're about uh, nine inches to the back the width there is about four and three quarter and the overall height is uh, about five and a quarter and for my friends who prefer the metric system uh, we'll say this is 
roughly 225 millimeters uh, deep. On the width, we're about 120 millimeters, and then the overall height, it is about 135 millimeters. All right, so I have the power plugged in, turned on. When you uh, hook up your ethernet, make sure you use one of the top two single gigabit ports, not the 10 gig yet, because uh, you're not ready to do that till you get everything set up. And uh, the main thing here, and this is really nice, this walks you through step by step. So make sure you go to the start.terra-master.com and it's, there's a dash in there. It's not just Terra Master, it's Terra-master. And that will walk you through all of the steps that you need to get your system running, including when uh, you get that little error message that the firewall is blocking it. You can just allow access on your network. But one thing I did have a little problem with is I'm using a couple of drives that were used on a Windows system. So I thought by just reformatting them they would work and uh, they didn't. So uh, what I have to do is actually start the system up and uh, you use the TNAS software to find the drive and once it finds it then you can start the login process. Uh, and then I'll be able to use these drives but for now I have them disconnected. And then of course the next step is to hit the login right here. And as soon as you hit that, this message comes up. So that tells me that I need to put the hard drives in now. And now that I have the drives plugged in, I get the welcome screen. And now we'll go to start. And there we go, it recognizes the drives. Perfect. And the next step is you select the option to install the TOS or the TerraMaster operating system and uh, it pretty much takes care of all that for you after you initialize the download. And now it is synchronizing the disks as it builds the RAID array there. And that can take, depending upon the size of your disks, uh, an hour or two hours, it uh, can be even longer. It, it's sort of a slow process, but it's necessary. Now I'll uh, take this apart so we can see what's going on inside. Now there are four screws and I've already loosened them so the back comes off here. So there are two at the bottom, two at the top. And in order to get this off completely, you have to disconnect the fan and it plugs in back here. I'll show you that here in a moment. And also notice that this HDMI port uh, on this back cover is blocked off, but that is a punch out. So it would be very easy to uh, open that up. Now looking at the unit, this slides out very easily after you take the back cover off. This just pulls right through like that. Now I think I'll go ahead and just take the hard drives out. There's the shell. You can see it's just, it's completely hollow. But I think what I'll do is pull these hard drives out to make this a little easier to manage because they're sort of heavy. So there is one. Ah, much lighter. Okay, so that's what it looks like without the hard drives in it. But here's the HDMI port I was referring to earlier. It looks like it is functional, so I might just plug something in and see if that works. I don't know if they missed the punch out because I've seen pictures of this particular model with this uh, opened up. So I don't know if they just missed it during assembly or what the situation is there. So next, I'll go ahead and separate the chassis from the motherboard. And there are just four screws that uh, hold this together. So this should be fairly simple. Now your back plane here for the hard drives, where the hard drives plug in, uh, that actually plugs into this little, looks like a PCIe slot, and you just rock that till that comes loose. Now there are cables over here that connect the motherboard. I'm going to leave those connected, so we'll just sort of set everything down like that. And that makes it a lot easier to see what's going on. So there's your 
uh, battery to hold the memory for your system, your CMOS settings. So it's a standard CR2032. And of course, here's this monster heatsink for the CPU. There's your speaker. We've got four little fan headers. So maybe this motherboard is used in uh, larger units, possibly, that have the need for fans. Here's a smaller secondary heat sink. And again, here's the clear CMOS button. We've got two little sockets there for a couple of extra fans. Uh, it looks like there's a large power connector that, uh, of course, we're not using. We're using the power uh, from the external power brick. And there are the four other Hynix chips. I'm not sure if that's onboard memory or not, because there are four on the back side too. So if they're half a meg chips, then that makes sense. That would be uh, four gig, but who knows? Now, this little guy here, it looks like a flash drive. I popped it out uh, earlier and I plugged it in to my system and system doesn't really recognize it and it asks to format it which I certainly do not want to do so we'll just leave it in there and not fool with it but you can see what the system looks like so there's a lot going on here on this small motherboard what I'll do next is get this all back together and uh, power it up make sure everything works make sure I haven't screwed anything up and then I will power it down again and pop uh, my memory modules in there one at a time and just see if it makes any difference. And uh, where you would probably benefit from additional memory is if you install the uh, applications that come with your toss operating system that is where extra memory would probably come in handy so if you don't use any of those and I haven't really installed any yet I've got docker on there that's one I installed but if you don't really use many of the applications then the additional memory may not really uh, come in handy so I'm going to leave the main shell off of it I'll get the hard drives uh, plugged back in and powered up, make sure everything works, which it should, but I like to double check, make sure that's seated. Sometimes it takes a little more, there we go. All right, so now I'll, uh, I'll plug the fan in. Sometimes these systems, if they sense there's not a fan, they'll, uh, they won't want to boot up. So I'll just plug this in and set the back cover like that. And get the power and the ethernet and we'll fire it up. like things are starting to happen there all right so everything seems to be working I logged into it over there so now we'll power it down and I'll try one of the memory modules and see if they work so actually these modules here are 8 gig and I'm not even going to try those because it says uh, you can expand up to an additional 4 gig so I've got a 4 gig from crucial I've got a 4 gig from a data so we'll try the A-Data first. I'm putting it back together. I actually had to pull the chassis screws back out and slide the motherboard away from the front cover because um, I couldn't get the module to lock in place. So keep that in mind if you do add memory. Now again, TerraMaster is very specific on the memory modules and uh, they prefer that you purchase them uh, from TerraMaster and you might say well they just want to make extra money 
off of you and I don't know that that's really the case. I think they put a lot of time and effort into making sure that the memory modules that you purchase from them will work and they're not going to give you any problems. So it's sort of uh, the, way, the way they guarantee that you won't have any issues because they've done all of the testing and verification up front. So if you purchase it from them, chances are you won't have any issues. All right, so I've got that in there. Let's turn this back up. Actually, no. Huh. It was all right the way it was. Plug the power back in. And fire it up. Well, the uh, A data module here, it did not like. It would not boot up. So uh, I took the module out and fired it up just to make sure, again, that I didn't mess anything up. And it is working just fine. So now I'll power it down and try this crucial module and see what that does. Well, it didn't like the A data memory module, but it seems to be functioning just fine with the crucial. It did boot up. There was sort of a, a delay and a long beep, so perhaps it was reconfiguring itself when it sensed that there was new memory in there. But you can see right here, it's showing eight gig instead of the four that come from the factory. So I guess I would probably still recommend going with what TerraMaster recommends, but I guess you can use an old stick of memory. So if you have some uh, existing modules just laying around and you want to test them, well, pop them in there and see if the system will boot up. Uh, if you don't have any modules and you need to purchase new, I would still probably go with the modules that TerraMaster has. They do have two available, a two gig and a four gig. Uh, you know, yeah, you can buy modules cheaper, but is it worth the headache of buying modules that may or may not work just for a little bit of savings? So again, I would probably just purchase what, uh, TerraMaster has available. Again, that way you know that they are verified to work with your system. Okay, so now I'll get this all back together. And actually, before I put this back into the shell and button it up, uh, I plugged in an HDMI cable into that HDMI port and uh, plug that into a monitor that is HDMI capable. So let's power it up. I'm curious to see what uh, what happens. This may just be like a debug port so you can sort of see what's going on. Yeah, there's the BIOS screen. So this will probably just uh, show the boot sequence here. And uh, you won't really get any graphical interface that you can use. You'll still need to use your browser. But this would be good uh, as a tool for debugging if you are having any problems. So uh, yeah, there it goes. So it's going to go ahead and boot up. All right. Well, that sort of answers that question. I'll let it finish the boot sequence. So it boots up fine. I can log into it through the normal browser access there. So I'll go ahead and power it down. So this is sort of a, a nice feature, but nothing the average user would probably ever really have a need for. So that answers the question, what is that port for? Okay, now that everything is running, this is your main screen. It has everything you need on it. The first thing you see here uh, is the toss help, and you can move that around. So if you click on the actual help, and it takes it a moment to load here, but you will get a very nice comprehensive uh, help section. Of course, the getting started here really helps you get rolling if you're not familiar with any of the uh, TOS or uh, TerraMaster operating system features and functionality. So while that's thinking about it, uh, we can talk about over here to the side. This is, this is the status of your system at a glance so you can see everything that's going on, get an idea of the workload, how much data is being moved back and forth. Okay, so now the help is uh, rolled up here now. So this walks you through all of the different things and it gives you a nice 
uh, explanations. So if there's anything you're not sure about what it does, or what it's for, this is pretty good. And I've used this many times when I first started working with these uh, TerraMaster units. So if you have a question, this is the first place I would start. But rolling through some of the stuff here, so you've got applications, and you can uh, basically install these. These are the little apps that are great for productivity, and you can scroll through here and see all the different ones. And then if you click on one, it sort of gives you a quick definition of uh, what it's for, and then you can install it and use it from there. Okay, the control panel. This is like your best friend here. So. The main thing here, when you're setting it up, of course, you've got the volume of your disk or how many disks you've got. You can set those up. You can look at uh, the health of your disks. So you want to become familiar with what's going on here. This is where you set up your RAID. And uh, the next thing is the remote access. This is what you set up when you're going to access your server from uh, your app, for example, on your phone. So you can do that if you need to get into your server and check things out. Control panel. Back to the control panel. Uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about is, here we go, network. So this is where you set up your network connections. Uh, it really does everything by default, but if you want to go in and make some more changes, you can, let's see here. Uh, you go back to network. Here's your network interface. Okay, so right now I'm connected to the 10 gig port on the back. So you can see here's the, uh, let's see, it has the speed on here somewhere. There we go. So this is 10 gig. That's the connection speed. If you don't want to use that, you can use either one of these uh, LAN connections, or you can create a bond and uh, join them together. So you end up with two connections moving data at the same time. So it sort of sees them as one link and that's called link aggregation. And of course you wanna make sure that the switch, the network switch or the router that you're connecting your uh, TNAS unit to uh, also supports the link aggregation. And going back to the technical support, you can talk to somebody online if you need to. Everything is really right here right in front of you. Again, the control panel is your best friend. You can set up notifications so that if uh, anything goes wrong, you get a little email. This is your update and recovery. This is where you do your uh, operating system updates. You can find them online, download them, and do it manually too. I've done that before. And then there's backup. So you can do some backups. There's time machine. It's a lot of a lot of cool features here. All right, now before I do any data moving, I'm going to test my speed to the network card or see if the network card is working at 10 gigabits uh, a second. So I'll use iPerf3. I already have it configured. And we'll hit enter here. And you can see the speeds are looking pretty good. 9.8, 10.2. You can't really ask for speeds any better than that. So now I'll move some data back and forth and see what those numbers look like. All right, so now I'll do a test here and I'll move this single file. This is about three gigabytes. I'll take it from my main computer here and then we'll move it over to the uh, NAS server here. Since it already exists on there, it's going to say, do you want to replace it? Yes. And these speeds look pretty good because I'm communicating with the server uh, through my gigabit switches. So this is about as fast as you're going to get. So 109 megabytes is about 800 and something uh, gigabits. And that's a pretty decent speed. And then here in a little bit, I'll move some data on the actual 10 gigabit switch and see what the speeds look like there. All right, so what I'll do now is move a few large video files from my test computer over to the NAS server here, the NAS box. And look at what kind of speeds we see. 
So it started off a little fast and sort of dropped down a little, but we're holding in the low 200s there, so not too bad. And I'll go in the opposite direction, so we'll copy these from the NAS down here and put them back on my main system, and let's see what kind of numbers we get there. Okay, so maybe slightly faster going the other way. But you know, you can do this test 10 times and you'll see these numbers sort of vary. Uh, they sort of fluctuate a little bit. All right, so the link aggregation is now enabled, which basically combines the speed of two ports. And uh, now I'll go ahead and move some data back and forth and compare that to just a single port running and uh, see if there's any difference. So now I'm moving files back and forth between the NAS server and my system with link aggregation enabled. So I'm just sort of looking to see if I can tell a difference when the link aggregation is enabled compared to when it is not, when you're just using a single gigabit connection. So we can sort of see the speeds there going both directions. And then I'll check it here in a little bit uh, with the link aggregation disabled. Of course, now this other section that I was copying is not competing for any bandwidth. So of course it shoots up and maxes out around 110, 113, 14, somewhere around there. All right, so I'll get this disabled and uh, see what the difference is. And now I'll switch from link aggregation. Uh, I'll disable that. We'll just go back to a single ethernet connection and check the speed, see if there's much of a difference. Now, if you have a switch that's capable of link aggregation, usually you need to go in there and enable link aggregation uh, on a couple of ports. So you need to keep that in mind. Uh, of course, I just went into the switch and disabled that. So again, I'll be back to just single gigabit speeds. And this is with the link aggregation disabled. I'm moving the same batches of files back and forth and uh, looking at the difference in speeds, if any. And I don't see a whole lot of difference. between running with the link aggregation enabled and disabled. There might be a little bit, but uh, I'm seeing really about the same. And of course, we'll see the other one pick up here. And it should top out around 112, 113. Yep. Now I'll go over some of the specifications and features, and I'm just going to highlight some of the big stuff. I'm not going to go over every minute detail. You can go to the TerraMaster website and look at all of this information in more detail if you like. That's terra-master.com. First, on the specifications page here, uh, the processor that is used is the Intel Celeron J3455. It is a quad-core processor that runs at 1.5 gigahertz, but it can burst up to 2.3 gigahertz. The onboard memory is four gigabytes. You can go from four up to eight. So you can add another four gigabytes if you like, uh, if you have a need. Storage capacity, the maximum internal raw storage is 32 terabytes, which is 16 terabytes times two. Of course, this varies by the type of RAID that you might be using. Power consumption is approximately 25.6 watts. And the RAID modes that are available are single, JBOD, which is just a bunch of disks, RAID 0, and RAID 1. And these are just a few screenshots from the TerraMaster website. So here it highlights the quad-core CPU, which can burst up to 2.3 gigahertz. The standard is 1.5. Uh, it supports, of course, up to 32 terabytes, which are two uh, hard drives up to 16 terabytes each. And it is a 10 gigabit LAN port. You do have 
uh, in addition to the two single gigabit ports on the back. So you have a total of three. All right. And next it talks about the performance here. It says it can go up to 651 megabytes a second. That's a little over five gigabits. So even though you have a 10 gigabit uh, connection, you'll use roughly half of it uh, as a maximum or the upper limit. And I did see in my testing, I wasn't able to really capture it, but a few times I did see uh, over 600 megabytes uh, in fairly short bursts, but it was moving up in that direction. However, uh, to achieve those speeds or to get close to those speeds, you need to use the recommended hard drives, which uh, in this case would be Seagate, Iron Wolf, six terabyte in RAID zero. That will help you get to those sort of uh, figures. On to the next one here. Uh, it talks about all the different backup options. You've got Time Machine, USB, external storage, as well as R-Sync remote backup. Uh, you've got all these different options here for your media server. You've got MB, Plex, Roku, and DLNA. Those are all available. Uh, these are all the apps. This is, I should say, this is just a sample of the many dozens and dozens of apps that are available. So uh, this makes my third TerraMaster NAS unit here. Uh, this is the F2. 422 and like the two previous units that I've had I've had no problems with it set up as a breeze Accessing my data also a breeze no issues no problems retail price is $359 For the unit here you do have to supply your own hard drives and that's pretty much the case with most Nash units that you see on the market So I think that represents a decent value especially when you pair it up with the hard drives that TerraMaster recommends. And keep in mind there are two other units that are similar to this. There are uh, the F2 422 that you're seeing here. There's the F4 422 and an F5 422. The other two having four and five bays there. The F2 has two bays. So if you need more storage, you have other options. Of course, TerraMaster makes several other types of uh, NAS and DAS, which is direct attached storage units for your storage needs so you might check that out so i would give this one the overclockers club gold award so this is chris with overclockers club thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe <laughs>